Hello, thank you. Uh, this is where we uh, have what we call our main talk, the longer presentation, kind of our main presentation of the day. And sometimes we have people from outside of our community, sometimes inside the community. Today we have someone from within our Oasis community. He is a physician who has spoken before. His talks are always compelling and interesting. And uh, we've got something new to learn. And Dr. Richard Andrews, thank you. So, um, yeah, the answer to this is probably no, but I figured it was uh, it would get your attention anyway. Um, unless you consider love to be an addiction, which we're going to talk about, actually. You do. So, full disclosure here, uh, I do have a mild drug history myself. Um, uh, you're probably not interested in the details of why I was arrested for suspected drug trafficking. Uh, well, okay. Um, when I was in college, I was walking back from uh, uh, I was walking back from the laundromat to the dorm, and a police car rolled up alongside. I was on a military base, so this was the military police. Um, and they said, uh, "Hold on a minute, sir. Uh, the detective wants to talk to you." Uh, so I waited. What else was I going to do? Uh, and then within a few minutes, uh, the detective uh, careens around the corner, nearly on two wheels, because this was a hot bust, obviously. Uh, you know, pulls up, uh, they get me out of the car, I'm spread eagled, they're examining me, the whole business. Uh, didn't find anything. Actually, they found something, but they didn't realize it. <laughs> and then they said, uh, we're taking you to the station. Uh, at this time, I was considered just about the cleanest student on the campus, like never did anything. Uh, and um, they took me into uh, HQ and uh, did a strip search. Uh, and the only thing they could find, which again, they didn't realize that they had the contraband, was two little packets of jelly from the cafeteria. Uh, and it turns out, uh, as I thought back on it, it turns out that uh, a friend of mine, another student, as I was walking uh, to the laundromat, she was walking back, she uh, made a big show, very surreptitiously, of handing me two jelly packets that she picked up from the cafeteria and didn't want to have in her pocket anymore. So she did it like this, you know. Uh, and, and that's what they saw, because they had the dorm under surveillance at all times. Uh, and so they picked up the cleanest student on the campus, uh, and they thought they had a big drug bust. Uh, and then after a while, they sheepishly had to admit that they didn't have anything. And by then, there were, I don't know, my sister had gathered about 30 students uh, in the uh, HQ lobby and demanding my release, et cetera, et cetera. So it was all very entertaining. And uh, I tried hashish once under the influence, I must confess, of a slightly older, uh, uh, a pretty woman. Uh, and um, hashish is uh, similar to marijuana. Uh, used to be considered a little bit stronger. Uh, it's, it's a processed form of uh, the marijuana plant. Uh, and, um, but these days, marijuana concentrations have risen such that it's probably no longer stronger than marijuana. Um, I was introduced to other drugs here at Oasis. Uh, and, I um, tried powder cocaine twice when I was uh, quite a bit younger. Uh, I didn't feel anything. I don't know if it was actual cocaine or not, to be honest. Uh, and I tried uh, psilocybin mushrooms, hallucinogenic mushrooms, twice again when I was quite a bit younger. Uh, I won't tell you how much younger. And um, the first time I didn't feel anything whatsoever. The second time, I, the only thing I really saw was uh, accentuated colors. Every color was, was highly accentuated, and that's about the only thing I ever experienced. And I experienced a stomach ache, which, uh, which is uh, a hallucinogenic stomach ache, which is actually rather common with hallucinogenic drugs of nearly any class, is that they often cause uh, abdominal pain. Um, today is, uh, as my brother knows, my father's birthday, uh, 7 August 1920. Um, and uh, much of what much of my interest in addiction uh, stems in part from what my father experienced and what the family experienced in connection with that. Um, he uh, came off of an Indiana farm, went to college, uh, and and some of this now makes more sense to me than it than it did in the past. Um, after I've learned a little bit more about the science of addiction and what we understand. Um, went to college. I assume I don't. We don't have the details. I think on his. Um, college of drinking, um, unless my brother wants to add something. 
Um, he went into the Navy, this was during World War II. Uh, of course, the uh, Navy flyboy culture uh, was, uh, and to a certain extent still is, you know, highly macho and a lot of alcohol and so on and so forth. And he was in his uh, early 20s, of course, um, which is a time when the brain seems ripe for uh, addiction in adolescence and the early 20s, uh, which may have to do with brain development, as we'll see later. Um, and um, he uh, suffered a permanent injury in the war. Um, he then got married to the nurse that took care of him in the hospital, had a couple of children, and in three days she died of polio. Um, and so he, you might say he had reasons to drink, um, and uh, perhaps more significant is the age at which he started using alcohol. Uh, and of course the cigarette companies during World War II, as you may know, were very good, very kind about making sure that all the soldiers had plenty of cigarettes uh, because they knew they were uh, addicting an entire uh, population there. So a huge number of sailors came back from the war addicted to uh, nicotine. Um, and, um, you know, he never drank alone. I'm not going to say he was, quote, a social drinker, unquote, because that kind of implies that you have an occasional drink or something like that. He, he was beyond occasional. Uh, he drank uh, pretty frequently, although as far as I know, and again, my brother can help expand on this, uh, as far as I know, he never drank by himself. He just didn't seem interested in that. Highly social, the life of the party. Um, and um, so, and a wonderful human being. So when I think about uh, drug policy, for example, and how should we treat addicts, uh, I often think in terms of my father. He smoked at least two packs a day for decades. He drank like a fish for decades. Um, you know, the kind of situation where you imagine, uh, where you can't imagine a time when he would not be doing these things. And yet, and it took a stroke, I have to admit, but after a pretty good sized stroke, uh, he, which he actually tolerated surprisingly well, he recovered quite well from that. Uh, but it did get his and my mother's attention. And um, so he w had an enforced period of not smoking and drinking. So he went cold turkey overnight on both of those things uh, and then seemed to do quite well for the last 15 or so years of his life with no alcohol. Uh, no cigarettes, and um, uh, and died at about 87. So he tolerated. Uh, uh, now he did get lung cancer and various other consequences, uh, but he tolerated uh, the stuff fairly well. Uh, addiction itself. I decided we would start with definitions, which is probably always a good place to start with. Um, and uh, the simple definition, as Merriam-Webster calls it, the dictionary, um, is as you see on the screen. Uh, strong and harmful need to regularly have something, and I underlined that, um, or to do something, such as gambling. Uh, historically, addiction was only defined in terms of um, drugs, that is to say, a substance that you take and then you get dependent on, either a physiologic dependence uh, or, um, or uh, behavioral uh, activities. In other words, the, our, our behavior in connection with an addiction uh, may be different, I say maybe, because addiction is poorly understood, a little bit different than, uh, than the physiological or body consequences, the physical consequences. Um, but it's actually kind of tricky, as with so many other things, kind of like with love and God and various other things, it's actually pretty hard to come up with a definition. Um, I remember uh, in the 60s, uh, a famous uh, Supreme Court decision regarding pornography uh, and they went around and around and around with the lawyers, of course, uh, went around and around and around with the lawyers on how do you define pornography. Uh, and eventually, I think this was in the final decision, actually, the final decision said um, something along the lines of, well, we can't really define it, but you know what it is when you see it, you know, which is probably not a very satisfactory definition after all. And uh, what I'm curious about with their so-called full definition, I actually prefer the simple definition, is here they talk about um, strictly about substances, and I think it's important to to incorporate uh, so-called behavioral addictions into the definition for reasons we'll talk about. Um, and uh, and then the more broad definition down below uh, 
persistent compulsive use of a substance known to be harmful. Um, now, of course, that, that suggests that if somebody were using a substance and got addicted, uh, if they didn't know it was harmful, then they wouldn't really be addicted, uh, which is probably a problematic definition as well. Um, you've heard me, uh, if, if you heard my other talk, you've heard me talk about Johan Hari, H-A-R-I. I guess I don't need to spell it since it's on the screen, but um, uh, fascinating speaker and fascinating uh, author, uh, journalist. Uh, I highly recommend his TED Talk, uh, which is entitled, uh, fa most fascinating TED Talk I've ever heard, entitled, uh, Everything You Think You Know About Addiction is Wrong. Uh, a little bit provocative, uh, but I highly recommend that. And I highly recommend the book. Um, and I found a quote early in the book, interesting, in which he talks about, because he himself was addicted. Um, he's a journalist and he wanted to be able to stay up long periods and be very productive. And so he was taking uh, anti-narcolepsy drugs, which is to say stimulants, basically, similar to amphetamines. Uh, and they did work for him. And they found he was able to stay up for long periods and be very productive. And, um, and then he had family members. He says one of his earliest memories in life is trying to wake up a family member uh, from, a, from a stupor, basically, a, a drug-induced stupor. Uh, and so his whole life, uh, he's been curious about addiction. Um, and he uh, decided to take some time out, about three years as it turns out, which was longer, I think, than he expected, to study uh, the nature of addiction. Uh, and also look at drug policy. Uh, and he decided to start in the U.S. because he had the impression um, from what he'd already read uh, that drug prohibition policies basically started in the U.S. and then spread from there to the whole world. Um, but I liked his quote here where he talks about, because he was so focused on his own addiction, he would frequently write about drug policy, but he wasn't open about his own addiction um, uh, he does not have narcolepsy, like I said, but he was using these drugs. And he, um, he realized that, or he felt that there was an element of hypocrisy in him talking about addiction and that kind of stuff, and yet here he was addicted himself. Um, and so he, he realized that he needed to take a step back, uh, because as he suggests here, if you're so focused on that, on that little paint smudge that's you and the people around you, then you're not going to get the big picture. Um, and I, I've been curious myself for a long time as a physician um, about, um, I mean, of course, I have a number of patients that have addiction issues or who are at risk for addiction issues. Um, I have uh, treated patients with addiction and continue to do so at times. Um, but, of course, you know, the average adult in the world, I would say, is addicted to caffeine, for example. Uh, and yet caffeine, uh, and the evidence is quite clear on this in the medical literature, Caffeine in moderate quantities for most people is simply not harmful. It simply isn't, you know. Um, you can talk about whether people should drink it or not, but that's sort of a separate issue. Uh, and so that struck me as curious because so often the word addiction is thrown around as if addiction per se were inherently harmful and it didn't really matter what the consequences were, just attaching the word addiction to somebody's behavior was, was per se harmful. Uh, and it didn't make sense because the average person is addicted to coffee and yet the evidence is quite clear that coffee is not harmful. So it doesn't make sense that addiction per se is harmful. And what I often tell my patients, for example, addicted to nicotine, because smoking is obviously harmful, the evidence is quite clear on that. Uh, but nicotine by itself uh, is generally not harmful. If you have a heart rhythm problem, you probably shouldn't be doing large amounts of nicotine. Uh, but for the average person, nicotine by itself without the smoke is generally not harmful, and you could probably do that indefinitely. Again, I'm not recommending it, um, but uh, you know. So I I tell people when I'm talking about nicotine replacement therapies, whether it's uh, patches or nicotine gum or the spray, any one of these, not everybody needs that to quit smoking because everybody's different. Uh, but some people find it very helpful, and as I tell my patients, it's like. You know, because their, their brain immediately panics when I suggest quitting smoking, uh, which is a normal reaction. Uh, and so I say, you're not really quitting smoking. Don't tell your brain you're going to quit smoking. Tell, tell your brain that you're going to switch from method A of smoking to method B of smoking, because you're still going to get the nicotine, 
because the smoke is what's hurting you. It isn't the nicotine. So relax about the nicotine. Let's, if that's going to help you quit smoking, then I'm all in favor of it. Um, the writings of Helen Fisher are quite fascinating. She's a biological anthropologist who specializes in uh, evolution of various things, including uh, human relationships, love, sex, drugs. Uh, sounds like a good job. And um, so she has written some fascinating stuff. I have uh, sources for all this stuff, by the way, which uh, if you want to get a copy of the talk, you're certainly welcome to. Um, and she and others have pointed out how love itself, uh, because again, it, it ties into certain circuits in the brain relating to reward and re re relating to our own, what are called our own endogenous opiates, the opioid-like molecules that our own brain makes. And obviously it makes sense in evolution for certain behaviors to be rewarded, um, including in the case of the human infant, you know, human brains, as you know, grow quite slowly compared to virtually all other uh, animals. And the human infant is uh, uh, helpless for a lot longer than virtually any other animal uh, and requires uh, ideally a pair bond in order to uh, raise the child to the point where it's not quite helpless anymore. Uh, and so if you could have a mechanism, this is what she thinks, and there's some evidence for this, if you can have a mechanism that keeps the pair linked, in effect an addiction to the other person, then that may, be, uh, may make sense from the point of view of evolution. And, and that's an example of the, taking the absolute longest view. Remember we talked about taking a step back from the smudges uh, to take a look at the big picture. There is no bigger picture than that. Um, uh, and it's not just a theory. Um, I found a new word, by the way, that I thought my brother would like, uh, limerence. Uh, I say my brother because he's, he and I like to go back and forth on, uh, do you know this word, do you know that word, that kind of thing. So here's a word, limerence, I'd never heard before, uh, the state of being love-stricken or infatuated. Um, and uh, functional MRI, most of you or virtually all of you have heard of MRIs, you know, a, a, a technology for getting, without radiation, getting extremely detailed pictures of the body or the brain. Uh, and functional MRI is just another version of that where they can look at, for example, uh, the oxygen state of blood in different parts of the body. Um, if you have um, blood that is still oxygen rich, that suggests that it hasn't yet made it to the target organ, in this case the brain, where it's going to be used on something, and they can map it fairly well through the brain, different parts of the brain, to see which parts of the brain are active under certain circumstances. And so uh, the picture of the functional MRI scan uh, is similar, as you can see, for people uh, in love and for people under the influence of certain drugs. And similarly for people who have been jilted, who have lost a lover, and people in drug withdrawal. So again, it's not uh, the nail in the coffin, but it's at least suggestive. <clears throat> and drug use isn't just for us. Uh, you know, I, I, one of the most fascinating experiments I ever uh, read about was a so-called accidental uh, experiment in which some um, primate researchers, I forget where in the world they were, but they had uh, an island that they lived on with a bunch of uh, uh, naturally occurring uh, uh, chimps. Uh, and they chose the island because this was a population where you did not have in and out migration of primates. They had a population they could study over the long haul. Uh, and every chimp had a name, every chimp had a number. Uh, it was obviously perfect for for scientific study. Uh, and the humans on the island had their own alcohol stash. <clears throat> and they, uh, for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, maybe the chimps are smarter than the researchers, uh, the chimps kept breaking into their alcohol stash. And no matter what they did, the chimps would get in there. And finally they realized that rather than fight it, <clears throat> they had a perfect natural experiment on their hands. Uh, so they studied the behavior of the chimps exposed to alcohol. <clears throat> and what they found was startling because just as with humans, uh, you know, a certain percentage of the chimps would virtually never try this stuff or maybe they would try it once and then never try it again. Uh, the majority were occasional users and then a certain percentage, almost identical to the human percentage, were problem drinkers. Uh, and you can say that was a coincidence, or you can say that there's some 
evolution behind that. <clears throat> uh, cats and catnip is another famous example. Uh, I talk about elephants and fermenting fruit uh, because there's a number of animals, including elephants, that enjoy their fermented fruit when they find it and, and they get drunk and stomp around and that kind of stuff. Um, and, and so you can talk about, there are so many people with an attraction to alcohol, let's say, that it, that may also have an evolutionary basis. Um, in the case of fermented fruit, you know, um, fruit for many animals, uh, like elephants and others, is an important source of calories, and when times are difficult and you're having to find food, uh, if you can smell your food from a mile away, which elephants can do with the fermented fruit, and then you get there and you really like it, then, uh, then that's gonna help you in terms of survival. So, uh, again, it's just a theory, but I think it's uh, a plausible one. Um, I mentioned it before behavioral addictions. Um, Mike, let me know when I'm running out of time, because I can stop at any point. Um, uh, behavioral... <laughs> yeah, stop, stop. At, least I, at least I think I can. Okay, very good, yeah. So behavioral addictions, I'm, I'm curious about. Um, many of you have heard of the so-called DSM-5, which is the psychiatry bible, uh, at least in the US, and it has some influence overseas as well, which is to say the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders, which is what psychiatrists and others go by, which hopefully incorporates the latest science in trying to understand psychiatric problems. And the latest version of this manual includes, for the first time, uh, gambling as an addiction. That is to say, a non-substance, it considers it an addiction, a non-substance disorder uh, characterized by the same stuff that characterizes using a substance. So the notion that all aspects of addiction are down to the peculiar aspects of the substance is simply not the case. Uh, certainly that's true on some level. Uh, each drug has unique qualities in the body, um, but then each of these drugs gets into and taps into and then activates circuitry in the brain, which we need to understand in order to see what's going on. Um, here's a few other examples of uh, behavioral addictions. Uh, and, um, and, and again, this stuff is poorly understood. Uh, um, I thought I would throw in a little Billie Holiday thing because you, uh, if you heard my first talk, you may remember me talking about Billie Holiday, a great jazz singer from a number of years ago who was effectively murdered by the narcotics police. Uh, she was in the hospital with a number of illnesses uh, and they chained her to the bed. Uh, and um, while she was in there, her I think it was her ex-husband, her pimp and ex-husband who had abused her any number of times, uh, wanted rights to her autobiography, so he came in and read the 23rd Psalm over her bed and she pretended to be un unconscious or asleep. And when he was gone, she had this quote, uh, I've always been a religious bitch, but if that dirty motherfucker believes in God, I'm thinking it over. <laughs> so forgive my uh, French there. I can stop, I can stop. Uh, and here's the second most surprising factoid. I'll finish after the next slide. The second most surprising factoid of this talk, it seems to me, is that, and the evidence, again, is very clear on this, um, of all the so-called psychiatric disorders, addiction has the highest odds of recovery. Um, it's, so often thought, it's so often said that, you know, once you're addicted to drugs, that's it. It's a, it's a downhill slope, it's gonna get worse and worse. It turns out the evidence suggests that that simply isn't the case. Yes, it's true for some people. Uh, emergency room doctors often have a skewed view of things, for example, because that's all they see. They see a skewed population. That's not the same as, you know, a day that looks at 40,000 people uh, chosen to be representative of the U.S. adult population and looking at what the numbers are there. Um, and then here at the bottom of the slide uh, is the one that I think is the most surprising factoid for me, at least, in studying uh, in preparing for this talk. Uh, can anybody figure out what those numbers are next to the different drugs? Any thoughts? How addictive they are? Yeah, you could say how addictive they are. It correlates with that anyway. Uh, that's the number of years that a typical cocaine addiction lasts, the number of years that a typical marijuana addiction lasts. Some of you may be surprised to hear the word marijuana addiction, but that's a real phenomenon. Uh, typical number of years that an alcohol or heroin addiction lasts, 
uh, and then prescription pain medicines. Um, again, it all, a lot of it has to do, you know, your risk of addiction is a function largely of the age at which you were exposed, um, largely because the brain, you remember the brain continues to form until about the mid-20s, and the portion of the brain that develops last is the portion of the brain uh, of the gray matter that helps us assess risk uh, and avoid risk, essentially. Uh, I think this is why old men send young men to war. Uh, <laughs> seriously, I think that is, you know, because uh, older people aren't going to put up with that, you know, and young people shouldn't either. Um, so I, I better stop there because I've got uh, any well, number of other.